I discovered opera when I was six years old because a music teacher uh, in my grade school, I was, a, I was one of those people unfortunately pushed ahead in school, so I was in the second grade then, and, and mentioned opera. I came home and asked my parents what it was, and my mother said to me, I said, oh, it's, it's where people sing where they normally should talk. And I said, what do they sing about? And she said, well, they have all sorts of unusual stories. Um, like there's a story of a woman who is put on a rock and put to sleep and surrounded by fire. And she has sisters who fly through the air. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. And I got up and ran around the table and I was told to sit down. And I said, that's fantastic. I said, you know, can I, can I learn about this? And she said, well, I'm sure there's a book about it. Because my parents had gone to the opera as a social thing. They, they, they were never, at that point, very interested, you know. So they got me a book. And the first thing I read was Valkyrie. And so then I read the rest of The Ring. And then I, from then on, and then I, then I, okay, so that was that. So slightly later that year, I pestered my teacher with, well, if this is opera, why can't I hear it? And she said, well, the, it's broadcast on Saturday afternoon. So I started listening. And the thing, the only thing I remember was that shortly thereafter, the next season, they broadcast a Valkyrie. And I, I mean, I can't explain it, but I know that it just absolutely blew my mind. I was just wild about, on the subject of it, you know. And so I started listening every afternoon, you know, every Saturday, every Saturday afternoon, I would listen. And I, I forget the exact year, but very soon after that, I heard about Opera News. And I had it, and I sent the money in for it. And Mrs. Belmont, who I fortunately got to know years later very well, and actually dated her daughter for a while, um, uh, her granddaughter, I mean. But uh, she, uh, she wrote me a personal letter back saying, thank you, you know, for this. It's so nice to have somebody who is the age, I was nine when that happened, you know, and so it was, so then I just, then the Met started, the Met came, we went, the first opera I went to was the San Carlo, the, the Fortune Gallo San Carlo opera in, um, and that was Aida and then Faust and uh, the only story I can tell about that Aida was that I, for reasons that are totally lost in family history, uh, I went with my teacher, not my parents, they must have not wanted to go that night or something, and the curtain went up on the standard, the usual Egyptian thing, and I and Ramphis started singing, and I I turned to my teacher and said, "What language?" And she said, uh, "Spanish." <laughs> so, so uh, but anyway, we went to Faust, and then my parents took me to Faust, and then the next year I saw Carmen and Trovatore, and then the Met came back to Dallas, and so that was always big big for me to go, and I went I met Mr. Johnson at some point right back then, and Edward Johnson and. You know, and I went all the time. I went to everything, every single performance they did. Completely. Completely. I mean, everything, uh, everything was, you know, I mean, I didn't, I never took a, I never took a course in it in my life. I never, I actually never took a music course. Everything I've learned, everything I learned was on my own. Well, Edward Johnson came to the, he, he went on tour with them, just like Mr. Bing. Mr. Bing didn't come as often, but, but Edward Johnson came on tour. And um, all I remember is I can see his white hair. I can see the way he looked. I just remember meeting him and coming up to him and saying, you know, my name and that I was, that I love the opera. And he was very warm and friendly. That's all I remember. Funnily enough, I can tell you that. And I, it's really... I can tell you precisely. The second performance of the Met, the first one they did in Dallas after the war was Rosen Cavalier, which I liked but didn't quite get. I mean, I was nine years old. It didn't quite, it was, and I remember it was the last time the Met ever came late in May because it wasn't air conditioned then. And it was, let me tell you, State Fair Auditorium in Dallas in May was not fun. And, uh, but the next afternoon was Rigoletto. Warren and Pierce, and, uh, and, and it was, you know, a spectacular Rigoletto. And afterwards, when I went home, I was sent outside to water the lawn, water the flowers. And I was holding the, I can remember this just as though it were yesterday, I was holding the hose. And I said to myself, this is my life. You know, and, it, and I never changed. Obviously, I had to fight my parents after, for a while they liked the idea that I was interested in opera, but by the time I was about 10 or 11, my father realized it was serious. And so for the next 20 years, I had to fight, you know, because I didn't want to be a singer. I didn't want to be a conductor. I didn't know what a director was. 
you know, and I just, you know, and, and he kept saying to me, what do you want to do? Just sit in an, in an orchestra seat and look at it all the time? What are you going to do? You know, this kind of thing. So anyway, it was a, it was a battle. I, my father was a doctor, a lot of doctors in the family, so I just went into Cornell Medical. Well, the reason I took Cornell Medical, because unfortunately, or fortunately, I could always take tests, and I, so I could get into schools, and so I went to Cornell, and so I, but I really went there to go to the Met, and that first season, I went to the Met all the time. Well, it didn't work with medical school, and uh, so after having a very good academic record prior to that, I flunked out of that first year, and so then, the next decision, since I came from a professional family, was to be a lawyer. And so I again took the test and I went to Columbia because, again, I would be in New York. And fortunately, um, I was able to go to the Met a great deal and, and do my law work. It was easier for me. And so that was more, more naturally for me. So I spent the three years at Columbia going to the Met a great deal and doing what I needed to do at law school to get through it. And, um, and then I was drafted with the, um, the wall, when the Berlin Wall went up, I was drafted. And that's a whole long story in itself, but the musical side of it, the opera side of it came when I was sent to Iran, to Tehran, because we had a huge military installation in Tehran. And um, I was, there, there was a, when I came, there was a sergeant who had a radio program of an hour of classical music. And so I took it over because he was leaving. And I expanded, and then, I, then people liked listening to it, and they got a lot of response, so it went to two hours. And after I did it for a year, I wrote Francis Robinson at the Met and asked him, and I also wrote Texaco and said, I have Met tapes from broadcast. Can I do a Met, can I, do, can I put it on the radio at this Armed Forces radio station in Iran? And they both wrote back and said, sure. So it was actually the first time I ever had a chance to do any writing because I wrote my own copy. And I did 22 operas, including a ring, in Tehran. And it had, we had a lot of people listen because we had a lot of Europeans there as well as the Americans who listened. And I, we've always, I mean, Lotfi always used to say to me that this may have been one of the reasons that the Shah, three years later, started the opera company, in which, as you know, Lotfi came, Lotfi Mansuri came and, and ran the, that company, but whatever, who knows. Anyway, I did it for the time I was there. That's the first time I had the opportunity to actually do anything. So when I came home from the war, from the war, there's no war, when I came home from the army and I came home and then I was at Fort Hood for two years and I didn't get to Vietnam. I, I was just too short to get to Vietnam, but I, too short time. But when I got out, I didn't want to practice law because I just didn't think it was right for me to do it. And I thought I would, since I didn't see, I thought, well, I would go in, I would get a PhD. And again, I'd gotten accepted in a school. At that time, I was going to go to Stanford. And um, my father said to me, now, this is just ridiculous. You go to one school after another, and all you want to do is the other. So why don't you go to, he said, go to New York. You can write now. He said, go to New York. And I'll, I will, and I was just getting married, too. And he said, I will, um, I will help you for the first year, and we'll see what happens. And I'll send you $150 a week, a month, a month, which is exactly what he did. And so I went to New York and started, and I, I sold the first piece. For the, actually, the first piece I sold was for the opening Metropolitan Opera program in the new house on the on, uh, Defraun Schatten. And um, then I sold other pieces. And then I began to know Frank Merkling, and I did nothing. I bedeviled him. I've told people, I've told young people ever since, you know, if you really want something, you have to go for it constantly. And I went to see Merkling time after time after time. And finally, when Eugene Rizzo left and went to Italy, he hired me. I mean, it's, it's been a really a fortunate thing. Harriet Johnson, who didn't know me at all, asked me if, you know, if I would take over for her writing at the Post, which I did. And then later, uh, after I'd done that for eight years, and, the, um, and Murdoch was cutting down on reviews all the time, and they kept asking me for reviews that I'd, for, when you, for more anecdotal reviews, and I said, that isn't what I do. Um, and uh, just about the time they were ready to get rid of me because I, wouldn't, I didn't yield to Mr. Murdoch's, to what they chose there, uh, Jim Levine, who I knew, came to me and asked me if I would do live from the Met. And so I switched over and one day switched to live from the Met 
And after I did that for two years, I was out here lecturing on the ring, and, um, and I did not come here. I did not go to the search committee. I went to the search committee to give them advice on opera. I never dreamt of having this job. Well, it was to me. You, you see, would I think it was as golden now as I did then? I don't know because, you know, with the lack of experience, but I know that in 1953, um, the first time my parents took me to, we went, went to Europe, the first time to Europe, the very first night in London, um, we'd come over on a ship, of course, that was the way you did then, and the first night in London, I said to my parents, I want to go to Covent Garden, and, and my parents said, oh, go, go, and so <laughs> go on and go, so I went, and they were doing Trovatore, and so I came in, and I was sitting next to a woman from Brooklyn. I remember that distinctly. And, and I looked at the cast. The cast, the names meant absolutely nothing to me. And after the second scene, I turned to her and I said, if this is the way they sing over here, we've got something to learn. Because the Leonora was Maria Callas. Big at that point. But I, so I was... I was in love with Collis's voice and with Collis from day one. All this business about having to learn to like her voice, I know a lot of people had to do that. I never did. I was crazy about it. And I was crazy about that. You know, I didn't see her very, you know, very much in those days, but I, mean, I did see that. And um, I saw some opera at that time. I mean, we saw different, so I don't know. It's a very interesting question. It certainly was, you know, it certainly was a different world. And I, I constantly have to explain to people, they say, why don't we have, you know, kind of the, the stars of that time? Well, I think it's very simple because we, we present, op we produce opera in a different way. Now we're interested in the total picture. We're interested in theatrical things. We're not as interested because, because Callas, whatever else you could say, she was always Callas on the stage. Tibaldi was. I mean, people went to hear Tibaldi for a beautiful voice, and I, and I was one of those people who actually was able in those fighting days in the 50s when everybody was fighting so much to like Milanoff and Tibaldi and Collis for different reasons. I never really, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I, I did take sides in the sense that I like Collis more, but I like the others. I mean, Tibaldi, people don't talk about this so much, but one of the things about Tibaldi was seeing her hand come out to take her curtain call, when you'd see her hand come out of the curtain and then she'd come out with that incredible smile. Frances Robinson always called it her cheeks of steel. You know, but the thing was that it was part, not only part of the way singing, but it was the personality that was so amazing. You know, and, and Milanoff was an, an eno a, a, a huge personality. I mean, it was, I don't think we would accept what Milanoff did on the stage now I know we wouldn't at all, because even then we laughed at it a little bit. But the voice was so amazing. I mean, the pianissimi was so incredible, and, the, and she sang so uh, meaningfully of what she did. You know, so there was a lot of stuff. Delmonico, I mean, all those people were, were um, really very, very interesting. And of course, Richard Tucker. Um, I mentioned Leonard Warren earlier because, I mean, Warren was it was a great I was there I mean I've been there a lot of times I was there the night Warren died I've always tried to there were, of course that was as I've as I've said and others have too on that night the Met must have been performing in Madison Square Garden since so many people said they were there but the uh, but it was I mean that was a night never to forget I didn't go to hear him I went to hear Tabali because it was her comeback uh, after she'd been gone for some time as in Forza and um, so you know, a lot of things, you know, I, I spent, and of course, but my great, my two great loves were, and I'm not, haven't talked about them, of course, were Riesenick and Nielsen. And my daughter, as a matter of fact, Riesenick was my daughter's godmother. And, um, uh, and, and Nielsen, I, I, I knew from, from before they came to the Met, both of them, oh, not, not with Riesenick, I knew her after she came to the Met. I knew Nielsen before she came to the Met, and, I, and those were the two people that I really, um, love the most. And I think that my own taste has been, was shaped by Collis and Riesenick and Nielsen more than anything else. Their way of singing, and their method, and their, and their involvement in, in the text. I'm interested in the text. I'm interested in what happens, you know, how they, how they work with the words, what they do. I, I mean, bella voce means nothing to me. 
you know, just pretty singing. It's nice, it's fine, but I don't care. And I've, and I've, this opera company has, is, you know, I've tried to, to avoid Bella Voce here in Seattle for these 29 years, or 28 years as much as possible. The only reason I'm here is because of, uh, because of really, I think, uh, one woman, Beverly Brazo, who, when I went to the, you see, the way it all came about in Seattle, I was lecturing on the ring. And uh, her son and her brother heard my lecture on Rheingold. And they, at this time, they were looking for a general director here. They went to her, their mother, who was, who was uh, working, who was running the, the volunteers. The, in those days, long ago, board members ran the ring shop. I mean, you know, that was, and she was running it. And so they went to her and they said, we found your general director. He's in there lecturing. And Beverly said, well, he's only a music critic. What are you talking about? And they said, go in there. So she went in for the Valkyrie and she, my lecture. She liked it, apparently. And she said, we want you to come to see the search committee. And I literally, honestly, didn't know what a search committee was, nor, what, nor for what they were searching. You know, and so I went and they asked me, but it was about, a, as I remember, a two or three hour session. Lots of people were there, more than just the search committee. There were a lot of, I remember, great many people, they asked me lots and lots and lots of questions about opera. And at the end, she said to me, um, I think you should apply. And I said, but Beverly, I'm, I've never put Bohem on the stage. And she said, it doesn't matter, I know you can do it. So I said, well, I have to go back to New York, and I have to, I have to talk to my wife, who wasn't out here, and I have to talk to uh, Maestro Levine, and several other people. And uh, Linda was thrilled about it, and I went and I, I, I told Jim about it, and he said, um, he said, you were never born to be a critic. This is what you were born to do. You must. So, I, and I never really, I mean, the, I know it was foolish to, admit, to say that you're, you know, without the, with the lack of experience I had, I realize now to take over a big company, but I never had any doubt because I knew, I, the one thing I did know in, in, in my, the one thing I knew was that I knew opera. And I knew I had strong feelings about how to do opera and how to put it on. But of course I didn't know, I, I'd done a little bit of, you know, infinitesimal bit of fundraising for the Met at that point. So I, I sort of knew I could talk about that. Administration, I'd never administered anything. Fortunately, I've had, always had good administrators here. Maybe, I, maybe <laughs> that's probably lucky for Seattle and lucky for me. But um, I, um, I didn't know anything about, I didn't really know how, the backsta you know how backstage worked and everything. I suppose the most challenging thing was, was figuring out budgets, was figuring out how to, how to work with budgets, how to work with, how to make it, financially, um, how to make it work financially. That was the most challenging to me. Uh, the backstage stuff was wonderful. I just, I took to that, uh, you know, and, and of course, you see, my whole practice as a general director came, what I do as a general director came about because I didn't know what most of them did. So when we did the first opera here, which was The Marriage of Figaro, which had been, which Glenn Ross, my predecessor, had, had cast and put together, it seemed to me logical to go to as many rehearsals as possible because I wanted to learn. Well, I didn't realize that many general directors don't do that, go to staging rehearsals. Well, to this day I do it because I've always felt that, it, that I think it helps the product and because I feel, see, I have a very American, a very un-European feeling about putting on opera. And I've had it from the beginning, and I will have it until the day I retire. That I am responsible as the general director for what goes on my stage. And I have to stand behind it. Uh, this doesn't mean that I have to agree with everything a director does. But if I disagree with what a director does, he or she has got to convince me of it. Now, I, I know in Europe, they hire a director, and they say, do what you want to do, and that's it. I just don't believe in that because I think my, my people, my audience expects more of me than that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's right. I don't, don't think that, I'm not saying it's the right way to do it, but that's the way I've always done it. So I started going to rehearsals. 
still done that. I mean, each of the steps that we've taken along the way has just come because of that. I mean, we started the question and answer sessions after the opera in 96, simply because we actually started them with the turn of the screw earlier because we were, because I simply didn't want to get all the letters that would come in from the turn of the screw, and I thought it would be better to answer the questions right then. And then two or three years later, my marketing director said to me, we're doing Turandot, and you better do one of these question and answer sessions. And I said, Turandot, what's wrong with Turandot? And she said, well, it's a terrible story. It's a ridiculous story. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a ter and I said, well, Turandot, anybody, and I, you know, I said, okay, fine. Well, that first session made me know I was going to do it for the rest of my time because it was, it's a wonderful way to cont contact with my subscribers and with the single ticket people and to do that. So, but it, it wasn't planned, it just happened and, and I loved it and so we kept on doing it. I really do because I think, I honestly think it is. Mr. Adler was the, was the brand for San Francisco. Mr. Bing was certainly the brand for New York. Lord knows Mr. Gelb is the brand for the Mint now. And, and Joe was too, Joe pretty much. I think Joe was very much, very much in that. I, I think that this is right. I think this is the way, and I, the reason it's right is because opera, unlike the other art forms, is still run by, in most cases, by one person. And I think that I've said to people, and I, and I, I know this is, is, this is very not, much not modern thinking, but to my mind, an opera company reflects my taste first. And the only thing I'm interested in when we do an opera here is whether I like the result or not. That's the first thing I'm interested in. The second thing is what the audience thinks about it. And that's all I care about. Now, if I present a singer here who I really believe in, and the audience is very blah about the singer, or, well, I've never had one that didn't like them particularly, but I mean, I've had it they're kind of blah about it. I may bring the singer back once more, but if the, if the audience doesn't react well the second time to a singer, even if I like them, I will probably hesitate on that because I believe I believe in the audience. I trust audiences completely, and I and I, I really do trust them, and I think that and they'll do that. But in terms of taste, I think it must be my taste. It must be the general director's taste that governs things because that's the way opera has always been done. You know, I regret that Mr. Bing didn't like Wagner. I understand why, because of his background. But I mean, we missed a lot of performances of Astrid Varney and Hans Hotter in the 50s because he didn't like Wagner and did as little Wagner as he could possibly do. You know, but that was his taste. And he did, we did, you know, great Verdi and a lot of other stuff that went on then. Mr. Adler, I don't know as much about the casting and what he, I mean, the, um, you know, the choices in opera that way. But I just mean, those are the two people who I, looked to as, as running successful companies. I didn't really go to anybody to say, well, I don't know how, the, how this happens, you know. Well, I'll tell you a story about that. I mean, in terms of funny stories uh, that, that happen in opera companies, the first opera I ever cast myself, oh, the first thing was The Ring of 84, which was which was Glenn Ross's, the last time Glenn Ross's ring was done, and I cast it. And uh, because prior to that, it, he had done that first season. This was, this was the first summer. And so I cast Votan, who, was, who I really believed in, and who did a lot of singing with me afterwards, because I didn't. And so, and I was sitting, not where I sit now, in the auditory, in the audience, but in those days, they, they sat up in a box in the old opera house. And the Rheingold started, and the very first arioso of Votan, he got to the high note and lost his voice. Now, when I say lost his voice, I don't mean just cracked. I mean the voice went away. And he spoke the rest of the opera. And I... Of course, now I would have gone backstage in two seconds. I would have tried, I would, we would have had a cover, you know. I mean, there, there are a thousand things I would do now. This would never be, but, it, but I was frozen in my seat. I mean, I knew this was the end of my career that started with one performance. You know, I knew that it was the end, and I didn't know what to do. I had, I had, I, I couldn't grasp, I could, first of all, I couldn't grasp it was happening. And then when I realized it was happening, 
I didn't know what you did. I, didn't, I, mean, I had no idea. And so we got through, and I tried to be nice to, you know, to him, and I had Valkyrie the next night. And so I went home, and I thought, well, I've, I've, got, I've got to do something. And I, fortunately, I had a lot of telephone numbers, and I knew where Tom Stewart was. And I called him in Santa Fe. Oh, no, I waited. And I, I'm sorry. It was, of course, it was the middle of, it was the, middle of the night. Because when I had to go to a dinner afterwards, that wrangled up, all sorts of things. So it, wasn't, it was later. So the next morning at 8 o'clock, I called, and Evelyn answered the phone. And I said, is Tom there? And she said, yes. And I put him on the phone, and I said, Tom, I've really got trouble. And I told him, I said, can you come? He said, sure, I'll come. And uh, he said, I got to take the cut in the monologue, but I'll come. And uh, so, you know, he, I picked him up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He talked to the director. He came in, and, and he was marvelous in Wotan and Siegfried, and, and it, was, it worked. But, I mean, I've had a lot of weird ring story. I could go on and on and on about ring stories I've had, you know, with Siegfrieds and everything. But that was the worst because I, and, and that really taught me something. I was amused. I'm always amused when people tell me they do rings um, and they treat it like anything else. Uh, I've learned over these last years that when you do a ring cycle, you cover everyone, even the bear. You know, you cover everything. You are ready for anything that can, can happen. Because everything, because whatever you least expect will happen. I don't know. That's just God's mercy. You know, that's, that's just a question of knowing, hearing somebody and believing in them. Like I have a young woman right here now who's singing Serena in, uh, in uh, Porgy and Bess, um, Mary Elizabeth Williams. And I, uh, I heard her in audition in 2006 in New York, and I knew it was spectacular. And she came here and did a second cast, a silver cast, as we call it, um, Trovatore, and, and she was marvelous. And she's come back now, and she sets the audience crazy. I mean, I think it's going to be one of the great Verdi voices of the next quarter century. Uh, I think she's amazing. But I mean, just I, I suppose it's I suppose it's because I really do have. You know, there there are a lot of things that there are some things I trust and in myself, and I do trust my feeling about voices. And I don't really care what anybody's done. Or where they've been or what happened. If I really believe a person is good, then I'll put them on. And I'm, sometimes I'm wrong. Obviously, I'm not always right. But sometimes I'm right, and, and when I'm right, then it's very nice. I do travel. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether I travel as much as other people do. I travel twice to Europe, a, I tra travel to Europe twice a year. Um, once in November when we don't do an opera, and once in in uh, the end of May and June when we don't do an opera. And I travel, of course I go to New York and audition, and I audition a lot in New York. I mean, I audition, you know, three or four days in a row in New York. You know, here I hear 80 to 100 people in New York when I go there normally. And um, I listen as much as I can. Well, singers you can listen to and if you really are confident in voices, you know what you're doing there. Stage directors, you really aren't. You know, they, they talk a good game, but are they really going to be able to be inventive? Are they going to get the people to do what they want them to? Are they going to be sloppy? Are they going to be, you know, too, um, too much of a megalomaniac, you know, to, to do it right. I mean, you know, just, just a thousand things. And that's really, a, it's really, you know, and so you, you, ha you work hard on that to figure out what it is. I think conductors and directors are both very, very difficult. You can't audition them. You can't audition. You've just got to believe. Now, with, with conductors, you can, with both, you can really see what they've done in the past. But what they've done in the past is not necessarily what they're going to do here or what I want them to do here. And you've also got to know that, you know, we're working with the Seattle Symphony Orchestra, which is our orchestra. Some conductors who, are, who have very good reputations uh, come in here and the symphony doesn't respond to them. We always have an acceptable performance, but, but it's a question of whether the symphony likes them, whether they wrote it. For instance, I mean, Asher Fish, uh, who is my principal guest conductor and conducts the Wagner here and a lot of other things, 
I mean, they adore him, and they'll do anything for him. You know, uh, they've been, they will, and they, they're, they're always responsive to give a good professional performance. But when, they, when you have the conductor who they really respond to, they're going to, it's like any other orchestra, they're going to do it. So you have to, you judge not only what I like, but what I think is going to get the best performance out of the players. And, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole complicated, it's what everybody in opera has to do. But they, I think they're much harder. I think, it, I think it is what you make a company out of. You see, when you, when you work with a company that only produces five operas a year, or eight when we do The Ring, you have a, different situ you have a very different situation from uh, the big rep companies, New York and Chicago and San Francisco. You have to, and I believe that what I need, to, what I'd like to do is to have a core of people, a core of artists who are familiar to my audiences, who they like and who they can experience, who they can look forward to hearing. And then in every season to add new people so they get new ideas, you know. And occasionally slough off people, you know, who, who've been here a long time. And I mean, you know, we've, you know, you, people have done lots of things here and then sometimes you wait for a while before they come back or you do that. But I think you build a company, since you don't have a company in the Met's sense. And of course the Met doesn't have the kind of company that it, it had when I started with the Met. I mean, the Met really had a company in the, in the 50s, I mean, where the people were here and they sang most of the year and they would come in and you knew who was there. That isn't the case now. Now, they, now people come from everywhere, constantly come in and go out all the time. So it's totally different. But I, I still believe that I need, a, that I need to have these, these people who are familiar to my audience. So when they see that, um, well, Gordon Hawkins is here doing Porgy now. They see Gordon Hawkins has done a, a, all the Verdi parts here. They see Gordon Hawkins, they're familiar with him. They know what this is. Uh, they, they know what he's, he's going to give to them. Uh, we're going to do Attila in, uh, in January of this year. John Redier, I started with John. John started with me at the dawn of his career in Don Basilio in 2000 in, uh, in, 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 the, in uh, Barbara Seville. Well, John's been back four or five times since, taken on big roles, the Huffman, the Huffman Devils, um, and, uh, you know, several other, several other very important parts, um, Bluebeard and... Uh, and he's always been successful. So the audience really connects to him. And, and certainly, Bill Burden is another person who's coming to do Orpheus. Bill came here uh, the first time he came back in the, in the late 90s to do a second cast, um, Gerard, Gerald in Lacme. And he's done a world of things here. And the audience loves him and they want to see, he's done things in the French repertory, in the Italian repertory, in, you know, all around. It's exactly right. A point of view is what I, because I have a point of view. I believe in, I believe in opera as theater. I believe in the words are most important. I believe that you can, that when you direct, when you, when you, you can, I don't mind uh, updating an opera. I don't mind moving anything around. I only have two requirements. One is that the words make sense because the words mean something to me. And two, that the music is not distorted. What I mean by that is, I, I, distorted is the wrong word, that the music is not contradicted. If the music tells us something is happening, then I think it ought to happen. For instance, let's take the most obvious example in the world. When Puccini requires St Tosca to put two candlesticks on either side of Scarpia's head and put the crucifix on his chest, I don't say you necessarily have to put two crucifixes, two, two candlesticks down or the crucifix, but you better do something because the music says bump, bump, bump. <laughs> so you've got to do, you can't just let that happen and not do anything to my mind. And, and God, God knows in the ring there are a thousand things like this and in Wagner in general. I mean, I, I, but I, this doesn't mean that I'm, I don't think that I'm, uh, you know, that I'm a, 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 you know, a screaming conservative. We've done a lot of, un, a lot of radical things here. John Rockwell thinks that I'm that I'm that I'm as a as a producer of opera that I'm too much. I didn't say too much, but he says that I he thinks of me as being someone in the middle, so that I'm not going to get headlines either as being a, you know, a, a, current, a conservative who does everything just the way it was always done, or radical things because I'm not as interested in the radical. 
I'm interested in things that are more in the middle. And I think he's right. I don't know whether they can be taught or not. I honestly don't know. I think some things can be, I don't think, I don't think appreciation of voices can be taught. I think you either, you either can do that or you can't. You either can, you know, I think that, I think leadership can be taught. I mean, I've, I, I, every year I, I spend some time with the Leadership Tomorrow group here in Seattle. I talk to them. I mean, I believe you can tell people what it is to, to make people loyal. Because one of the things we haven't talked about is, and I think this is very much a part of leadership, is that most of my, that my, art, my entire artistic staff uh, has been with me for almost 20 years. Uh, and I think that, that the other part of the opera, there's more changes in development because development tends to rotate a lot. Uh, the only reason we've ever changed in marketing is because of, you know, somebody having a baby and wanting to go off with the child or, or whatever, you know, things like that. I mean, we've, we've kept a very stable, this company is very stable. I, well, I think that's what leadership is. Caring, I mean, it, you know, if anything you say sounds, sounds dumb. I mean, you know, be, caring about people, being interested in people, you know, letting them talk to you, talking about them, you know, keeping an open door. Anybody in the company can come to me about anything. Even though Kelly Tweedale, my wonderful executive director, is the real administrator of the different divisions, anybody comes to me and, do, and does. But I think, the, I think the way you work with people, I think it just, you just have to, you know, and I think you can learn how to do that. I, I think it's helpful if you know, but you can certainly learn how to do it. You can learn by watching other people who are successful. Warren Buffett, for instance, I, I mean, I gather he's very successful with his people. You know, and I think there are a lot of people like that who have, who have been successful with people who work for him. Well, I hope that's right. I mean, you know, I mean, for instance, I, I know that I'm not, you know, I said at the beginning about administration. I mean, you know, I, I get bored with that. I, I'm not interested in it. And I, and I certainly expect people to prepare budgets for me. I hate budgets. I hate the whole budget process. I hate it all. Everybody does, I suppose. But I just, you know, and I, and I you know, but, but when confronted with it, I live with it. I mean, I've, you know, in the last two, three years, please tell me what we've had to do to change operas and to do things, the horrible embarrassment of changing things and losing things. But I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to keep the company going and I'm going to keep the, the same quality of opera. I'm not going to drop, I will not run a company that doesn't do class A opera. I mean, I won't. And therefore I will do what it takes to do that. But I don't like having to deal with the budgets and the money and the, I get tired of it. I don't mind raising money. I don't, I'm not, I don't think anybody's Maybe some people just love to do that most. I, I find some people who, who seem to enjoy that more than anything else. I don't. I don't mind doing it. It's it's not something. It's not my favorite thing. But I mean, I, but I had lunch practically every day in May and June of this year, <laughs> so with people doing it, you know. And and that's interesting. I mean, it's interesting. It's just that you know, it's not exactly my the thing I want to do the most in the world. I am proud of the fact that, I mean, after all, you're, you're correct to say reinforced because Glenn Ross, my predecessor, was marvelous about starting the ring. And he also did something that, that it's, it's interesting, I have to say this about Glenn, because he did something that, that I never approved of, but it was, a, it was a, absolutely the most brilliant marketing thing that anybody ever did in terms of opera. Because when he started the ring here, he treated the ring as though it were Traviata, and he, because they did a series of in the original language and they did a series in English. And he did the ring in both German and English. Now, I never agreed with it. I never did it, never believed in it because you never have time to rehearse the ring under the best of circumstances and rehearsing it in two languages is insane to my mind. But the whole world knew that he did it in German and English. And literally to this day, if I'm, when I'm traveling in Europe, somebody will say to me, oh, Seattle, the ring, you do it in both languages. And I always say, no, we only do it in German. We don't have to do it in English, you know. But I mean, you talk about, a, you talk about something that's stuck. Nothing ever stuck like that. And, and um, so it was a, it was a but, but in terms of international, well, I suppose, you know, I'm sorry that they don't pay attention to it overseas, but 
I figure I, it doesn't worry me so much because I think that we are blessed here in Seattle tremendously by having a niche. And I think a niche is probably the most important thing for an opera company. We have a Wagner niche. People know that we do Wagner. He's, Wagner's name is in, our, uh, is in our statement of what we do, you know. And this is known all over the world in opera. And I think that's very good. I mean, you know, it's, it's just like when David was in uh, Houston, uh, Houston was known, uh, when David Gottlieb was in Houston, Houston was known as doing new operas, which is wonderful, and that's what they were, they were known for. The Met has always been known as presenting the greatest singers in the world. Well, I think a lot of companies don't have anything special about them, and this is what we hold on to. So I don't care. I mean, you know, yes, we've done a lot of things here that are good, I think, and, uh, and that people have been, but it doesn't worry me because, it, because what they, they know what we're famous for, and they think of us in that way. And frankly, if you can do Wagner successfully, Really, you ought to be able to do anything else, because nothing is, nothing is any harder. I know that, that, uh, that War and Peace in 1990 was a huge jump leap for the company, with, and Francesco Zambello did such a marvelous production of it, which was one of the things that established her, I think, as, as, a, as a great director, because it was, I think it's still the best War and Peace that I've seen. I mean, I will say in all honesty to that, um, and I think she did an incredible job with it, and that was a big that was a big thing to do. And we did it, you know, and and those were, you know, it was the, the, that was the perfect. I mean, it was, and one reason it was so successful because it was the summer of Glasnost. It was the summer when everybody was really feeling wonderful about the 1990 when the Russians and everything. And so we had a half, we had a lot of Russians in the cast, and we had, you know, while they were here, St. Leningrad was changed back to St. Petersburg. I mean, I remember literally during the performances it was changed back. And, um, but that was just doing an opera, but it was still a pretty far, it was a pretty much of a leap in order to do it. Um, I can't think of anything else really that was that where I went out did something quite as unusual as that. Maybe there was something, but I don't place it. They, the thing was, you see, when they came to, when, when we knew we were going to do the Goodwill Games here, and we didn't know, you know, at that time, the Goodwill Games were supposed to take place in America, and then two years later in Russia, and then back in America, and you know, it was, going to, it was a big deal. It was starting in Seattle. So it was a big civic thing. So it seemed to me we weren't going to do a ring that year, and it seemed to me we should do something Russian. Now, where I came up with the idea of war and peace, I don't remember. I knew I had seen Sarah Caldwell's war. I think it came from that. I had seen Sarah Caldwell's war and peace not in Boston, but she brought it to New York at Carnegie. It was a cut version of it, but she did it at Carnegie, and I liked it. And I knew we needed to do a Russian opera, and I didn't want to do, well, I mean, it wouldn't mean anything to do Onegin or Pikdam or any of the standard things. And so I think, I think that's what, I wanted to do something spectacular. And I think that's where it came from, my own experience with War and Peace with her. There may be a better story than that. I, I don't remember. There may have been somebody who told me to do it. When, when I was going to do it, when we decided to do it, I said that, um, and our, my, one of my fellow honorees, John Conklin, uh, was certainly, you know, did the sets. Um, we, I said that I had to have a good many Russians in the cast. And so I went to... Petersburg, I went to Leningrad then, and to Moscow, and I heard all the singers. There's one funny story about that, too, because um, when I was in Leningrad, um, there, at the time, the director of the opera, of the, of the Kirov, um, they, they let me hear everybody in the company. And I went to the director of the Kirov, who is a rather well-known conductor to these days, um, who told me that... Um, I told him that I wanted Vladimir Chernoff to come and do The Prince, uh, 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 um, Andre, And um, he insisted that there were two or three other people there who were better. And I said, but, but you said that I could take whoever I wanted, and I want this man. 
And we went back and forth, and he said, well, yes, but you're making a mistake. Well, I've always been glad to have made that mistake because he was marvelous. And, uh, and but, but I got four or five Russians, and um, they were all good. And, and then we then I I knew immediately that Sherry would be that Sherry would be a marvelous Nat Natasha. Sherry Greenwald would be a great Natasha. And um, and I just thought that Peter Cazares would be a wonderful Pierre Bazukov. And I think of all the things Peter did for me as a singer before he became a director, maybe that was the greatest. You know, because he was he was just exactly right for Pierre Bazukov. He you know. He, Played it with the, I mean, I, I have this recollection of his wearing glasses. I don't know whether he did, but you always think of Bazukov with glasses on, you know. And you just, you know, you think of it, it, it really worked, and it was very exciting. Mark Aramler, who's passed away, was the conductor. And um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. I mean, it was, we loved the work on it, and we didn't know, we didn't know what was going to happen with the audience for reasons that I never even knew why I did it. I had suggest, I said the first performance would start at four in the afternoon on a Sunday. And it happened that it was hot, very hot. The auditorium was air conditioned, it was all right, but it started at four o'clock. So people dressed up to come at four o'clock and nobody was very happy about that. And I just remember that, that it was the first of, oh, I think we did, well, in those days we didn't do as many performances as we do now, but we added two War and Peace's performances, I know, because it was so successful. But it was when the, when the curtain came down at the end and the entire audience stood up instantly and cheered. <laughs> we knew we had, we knew we really had something. Well, it was always, the, what, the Young Artist Program uh, has, has been very special to me because, first of all, we waited longer than most people to start it because I wanted to make sure we had our finances in order before we did. We had to retire a deficit, which we, fortunately, we've, we have managed to have um, 18 years, 18 balanced budgets in the last 19 years. And so after we had two or three balanced budgets, then we started the Young Artist Program. And I wanted it to be a performance. I wanted it to be performance oriented, production oriented. Um, and that's what we started to do and that's what we've done. And we've always had a um, fully staged, costumed production every year. And. Uh, I think it was the, that was the main thing, and then you know as the years have gone on, we've learned many different things about it. Get more coaches in, do more work on them, you know, find out what they wanted. You know, we always have tried to teach Italian because my big thing with singers is always, always, always with American singers is learn language, learn language. You know, I don't care about singers. I mean, I know this is maybe not a popular idea with music people, but you know, going to schools where they do nothing but music is to me a, a, not good for opera singers. It may be great for, for instrumentalists and other musicians, but I think opera singers need to learn history, they, and, but they need to learn language most of all. And they've got to have, they should have at least one second language in which they're fluent, and then they can pick up the other two. Whether it's German or Italian, it doesn't matter. You can pick them up, but if you learn, we all know if you learn one language pretty well, the others are easier. And I think it's I, as I tell singers, I never give a lecture to young singers, I don't say the same thing. Namely, that Americans are, are musicians, singers, have wonderful ears. And so a singer can listen to Italian and can parrot it, sometimes wonderfully. I know one famous tenor who never has learned to speak Italian and who sounds as though he knows it perfectly. But the problem with just doing that is you do not understand emphases. And I think that if you, if you take it, and what I would say to singers, I'll just say this to you, I mean, is that if you say, I want to go to town, uh, there's a world of difference in I want to go to town, I want to go to town, I want to go to town. Now, as Americans, we have no problem knowing exactly what I mean in each one of those things. But a singer who has perfect sound in German or Italian or, or French, might not know what, where to go with that. And that's why learning, not perhaps fluency, but at least the ability to get along on the streets of Rome, Paris, or Berlin is so important. And I constantly talk about this. Because that to me, because American singers are always well trained. I mean, they're not going to get to me in a young artist program without being well trained. And we, we have the best training in the world here. Technically, Americans are great. 
the next step is what's important. I mean, you know, you do auditions as I do in Europe, because I do a lot of auditions when I go to Europe, too. I didn't mention that with auditions, but I audition over there in, you know, four or five cities, or more than that. Whenever, wherever I am, I audition. It's such an interesting thing, because you audition in America, and everybody is technically perfect. But you, I'm only interested in the ones who bring something to the text and understand what they're singing. You go to Europe, and they always know what they're singing, and they always work on the words, but a lot of times they're technically not very good. I mean, it's just, it's, 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 you know, time after time after time, this is the case. Well, it was needed because the old building here, which have, from which this was constructed, was first of all, well, the, the beauty of getting it was because it was earthquake unsound. So we had, that was, that was on our side because it was not sound and we could get red tagged at any point which means nobody can come in. So we really had a, you know, a, a cause, a, a thing to work on. And, but the things that were wrong with it was, it was a good acoustic house. It wasn't a great acoustic house, but it was a good acoustic house. There was never any trouble with acoustic. It was, had patches where it wasn't perfect, but it was good acoustically. But it was set up as a general, as a general auditorium, and the sight lines were terrible because it was very broad, much broader than the stage, and so we needed that. Backstage was, had not really been done over since the original hall was done in 27. There were, there were one or two new rooms, but the, as, when I took the city council around here trying to get money for it, several of them said, my gosh, the jail is better than this, where we'd put people in the, in the secondary, in, in not, not in the two star dressing rooms, but in the others. I mean, they said, I remember they said to me, the, our jail is more attractive. You know, because there were no bathrooms. There was a, you know, for, for, there were two star dressing rooms that had bathrooms. And then all the other dressing rooms, they had to use one bathroom or two bathrooms. I mean, it was a mess. And there were no showers. You know, there was a, it was just not good. So there was a whole lot of stuff that needed to be done. We put on a lot of great opera in that, in those years, and through those years. And so, but we really had to have it redone. Because politics has always been the thing next to opera that I'm most interested in, and because I've never, never played games here with being a Democrat and, and believing in, in you know, one particular aspect of, of po politics and believing in it and caring about it, and so I do. And so I care about it, and therefore when the, when the uh, big thrust came to destroy the NEA in 94, um, the next day after the election, or at least a week after the election, I said, you know, we're going to start something. And we st I think we started it here. We started the reaction, you know. And I was determined to go to every one of our, well, our congressmen we hadn't had any trouble with, but with senators in those days, we did. And I was determined to fight because I thought the NEA was important. And I thought, not because the NEA gives so much money. I mean, the NEA, the whole idea of destroying the NEA was, to me, just obscene and silly because it, it's about one millionth of the federal budget. And it was obviously being done because the people that wanted to destroy it hated the idea of supporting the arts. Well, that's why I thought we ought to fight. And we did. Absolutely, not at all. I think an artist, like anybody else, is, is very much has to be very much engaged and be part of it. And, and in, of course, I, I work in Seattle. Now, I, and Seattle is a very open and friendly city. And I'm sure there are cities where the general director couldn't state a political preference, whether it's Republican or Democratic. But everybody knows what I am here. You know, they don't care. It's fine. But that's Seattle. I mean, we are, this is a wonderful place to work because we are, it's a very, you know, we, they make jokes about us being polite because Seattle is very polite. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's polite to excess at times, um, but you're, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a liberality, I'm not talking liberals, but there's a liberality in the city that is wonderful. I mean, we've been, you know, and because people are, you know, allowed to do their thing here and there's no, nobody says you have to do any one thing to do it, you know, and I think that's part of, that's part of why I'm as free as, can be as free as I am. I think it's in great shape. I think it, you know, everybody, you know, as, as I always say to people, I'm sure that, that two things about opera one can say. One is that probably, and both of these things must have happened at the premiere of the coronation of Papaya in 1640. 
there were people there who were talking about the fact, well, it's good we're getting to see this now because operas, because this will be one of the last things we get to see because it's on its way out. There are not enough people here to see it. They said that. So it was dying, I'm sure, in 1640. The other thing was, there were people, other people in the audience who said, well, you might like this, but if you'd gone to see Orfeo in 1600, you know, 30 years ago, it was much better. They had better singers. I mean, we are, those two statements are made, those two statements are just part and parcel of what we live with. I think opera is doing fine in America today. I mean, it doesn't have a, you know, we're, we have, uh, we are, it, I mean, this, this crisis is, is hitting us harder. The, the recession hits us harder than it does most people uh, because we are a people art form. And uh, it's, it's tight and it's very difficult. And I, I mean, I, I really feel very, you know, I, I mean, I think that some people have a lot of trouble uh, and there are people having a lot of trouble, but everybody's having trouble. I just, all I'm interested in is I think our audiences are enthusiastic and the one thing we have to get us through this terrible time is the fact that opera people know that the only way that opera exists, has ever existed since 1600, has been generous giving. And they will give to us because they care about it. The passion of the opera audience is what's going to carry us through. That's what's carried us through. It's what, it's what Mrs. Belmont uh, put together in 1935 when she founded the, when she founded the Opera Guild because she knew that, the, that people cared about opera and that they were willing, she believed, nobody knew, I mean, she was the first person ever to think about it, but she believed that they would give. And you're, you, you know of the Ten Cup campaigns, you know of all those things, and it proved that she was right. That's why, that's why I think sometimes people forget people like that. Eleanor Belmont was absolutely more important, so terribly important, to what opera has been in America in the last 70, 80 years, and what she thought about. And it was not just founding the Metropolitan Opera Guild. It was, it was because she, she tapped into the, the sense that people care about this art form. And that's why I don't, ever, I don't worry about it. Because the, you know, the, the people who give you a lot of money and the people who give you what they can, they give you what they can give. Well, the advice I would give to a young general director is to know as much about opera as possible, to listen to as many singers as you can, to go to as much opera as possible, to just live within our world. I mean, that's what matters. The money is going to come in if you do good work. The people are going to come if you do good work. But you have to know what good work is. You have to know, you have to care about it. You have to be involved in what's going on in the theater. And you have to, and the people, and I think one thing, you know, I, one thing I didn't say is that, yes, I, I kind of fell into this business of coming to rehearsals because I didn't know any better, because I didn't know that anybody didn't, people didn't do it largely enough. But I think one of the reasons that has been, one of the things that I know this brings to people is there, if the man who writes the checks is there, there's a certain seriousness, not solemnity, but seriousness to rehearsals, you know, because people are not, you know, they, they, they're going to do their best in a rehearsal. They're going to work on it. And I think that's made a difference. I certainly didn't start with that in mind. I never knew that, but I know it now, you know, and I know that that makes, so, I mean, get involved, get involved in what you're doing with the art form. I mean, the other stuff is all fine. The, the dinners, the lunches, the businesses you have to do, that's just, that's just what you have to do because you're in this job. But, what you, but if you don't care about opera, if opera is not the most important thing to you, then you're completely in the wrong business.